it's very helpful in, in a sense having had the, the two minute slot earlier about the British Council's Cultural Protection Fund because that's one of the British examples of cultural diplomacy that I'm actually familiar with uh, despite quite a lot of time working overseas and in the cyclical series that uh, Rob mentioned earlier I was in the one before that in the mid 1990s doing uh, trade missions and, and the problem is that they all individually are this good but there's no carryover so they don't build into anything that's more sustainable and that's one of the things that the cultural protection fund <coughs> does and that's one of the things that I thought we might I might try to open up into a slightly bigger discussion um, through the use of my, my case study so I'm going to use use three um, uh, two from Africa one from from Asia Senegal Congo and Mongolia I'm going to go through them fairly quickly because Actually, we did a lot of archaeology, we did a lot of cultural heritage, and most of you know about that stuff. I don't need to tell you about digging a hole in the ground and finding nice potsherds. I don't probably need to tell you very much about meeting with local communities and understanding their, their, their culture, things that are non-tangible, like religion and beliefs and, and family structure and, and things like that. So I'll mention that, but, but I'm going to try to move on toward, from that into something that's, that's more, more general and more broadly based. So the types of work I've been... Hmm, formatting has gone a bit weird. Okay, uh, the types of projects I've been working on often have fairly high-level sets of objectives or goals, um, which I've put up. And so th there are the usual things about identifying, evaluating, understanding, and promoting the tangible and the intangible heritage. But then it goes on because the context for this work is commercial, it's environmental impact, it's archaeology or its cultural heritage while development is going on and that means it has to go beyond the simple act of digging a trial trench it's all about dealing with people and local communities and their interest in things it's not archaeology as we know it Jim it's something very much different from that so the, the goals have to go quite a lot further so it's public outreach it's education it's advocacy it's structuring tourism in the future so that it is more sustainable, so that it carries lasting benefits for tangible things like archaeological sites and monuments, but intangible things like local communities. Um, and, and these elements are common through each of the three case studies that I, I will go through very briefly here. Um, and, and so the, the key part of them all is in finding a balance that it's not a matter of stopping development, it ain't gonna happen. Cultural change is gonna happen anyway, and that's the common, that's the inevitable part of all these projects. Things are going to change. It's managing the process of change and finding a balance. And that's not me finding a balance. I'm the expert, but in Felipe's words from this morning, that's the wrong kind of expertise. That type of balance has to be built upwards, and it's not it's not mine to give, it's not any of ours to give, it's something to find, to discover, and to develop with the people who are most affected by the projects that I'm part of. So it's not so much about preserving things, it's about establishing a process, in my words, by which local communities determine who they are and who they are to become. So it's managing, it's helping them manage their future. Uh, first project was called Sabodala, out in the far east of Senegal, quite near the border with Mali, uh, the upper valley. Uh, it's on the threshold between the upper basins of the Gambia and the Senegal rivers. Uh, a mining project, very large scale, um, pretty useless site plan. Um, we did the usual things. We did tangible resources, did a survey of um, 10,000 hectares. No, yeah, 10,000 hectares. Um, found 274 archaeological sites. Great, really good. Also did a lot of intangible work, a lot of ethnology and ethnography amongst the local communities who were being radically affected by the activities of a number of mining companies and all the infrastructure that goes with them. Um, we, we have often misperceptions. I thought I was going into a third world country and I was living in a mud hut. That's true. And yet things that happened on our project were the next day debated in Parliament in Dakar because the local communities are not isolated. They're not impoverished in the cultural sense. And everything that we do has a ramification right the way across. In this, in this case, uh, about a 14-hour land journey from the project area 
to the parliament building in Dakar. And yet, the next day, activities on site were being debated there. So another part of the project was, was building capacity in a country where there is, in our terms, very low capacity. There were, um, I'm trying to estimate how many people are sitting in this room. When we arrived in Dakar, there were about one third as many archeologists in the entire country as are sitting in this room. Give you, give you an idea of scale? One third. Actually, we might just say that everybody on that side of the aisle were real archaeologists in Senegal and the rest of you don't even exist. Makes it really difficult to do a project out there. You've got no one to work with. You've got no one who can explain what it is you're finding. I've got a pot shirt. How old is this? Nobody knows. More importantly than that, you've got no one to help you in the dialogue of, I found a pot shirt. I found a site. How important is it? You can't even have the dialogue. There's no discussion. There's no one to discuss it with. So capacity building from the very beginning had to be part of a project. And it was built into a purely commercial project. And one of the things we did was work with the uh, IFON, the old French Colonial Research Institute, um, in order to develop a capacity inside the university which had an outward commercial face, focus. Um, so outcomes, yeah, we had a, a couple of really good ones. Um, we, we trained uh, a team of six archeologists educated for those, um, oh, we haven't got them here. For those who belong <coughs> to professional institutes where an academic degree is important, these guys would qualify because they have MAs. Uh, three of the six now have doctorates as well. But they are trained in field ex excavation survey, just as we do it. I happen to think that the way we do it is really good. So we trained them in our system, but it was not just a UK uh, based project. So they, they learned an amalgam of systems used by the larger um, field units in North America as well as in two European countries. Um, and that team have now gone on to train further another generation and to practice their skills in three projects independent of mine in other um, African countries. We took three students, trained them up to MA degree and beyond in ethnography, and they now work in both uh, Senegal and in neighboring countries. And we worked to strengthen two uh, two uh, non-governmental organizations based in Senegal, as well as their own Ministry of Culture and the subdivision within it, which deals with cultural heritage. So I think that's a really good outcome. And that was achieved on a commercial project with no support from any government at all. Uh, another another case study, um, Sintacola, which is in Congo, the Republic of Congo, not the Democratic Republic. Uh, up in the corner um, where Congo kind of pokes up into Gabon. And this again was a mining project. Uh, the first was gold, this one is um, potash. Uh, so a very large mine footprint and then effectively a, a six lane motorway which was used to carry the potash, is being used to carry the potash from the mine out to the coast, a coastal facility for the processing and then the export. Um, and it included pretty much the same repertoire of things we did surveys for tangible uh, resources, uh, much a very interesting, archaeologically, this is really interesting. I won't go very far into it because we haven't got time, but found um, only about 60 sites, but some very interesting spatial patterning going on there. Um, we did a lot of work on intangibles, a very, very interesting local set of communities with some very powerful social and religious institutions, which, which do, in a, in a very real way, govern how those communities interface with a mining organization. And it's kind of a case of, whoa, two groups passing in the night with no, immediately, from the beginning at least, no method of communication. The mining company had no way of knowing how to deal with a local community who just simply didn't think in terms of money and don't even have a concept for personal or even familiar ownership of land. Mining companies are interested in money and land. It's like, can't communicate. And then lastly, the need for capacity building again, training the Congolese ministry officials and local student. One local student. How good is that? The one student in the whole Republic of Congo. One archaeology student. And get this, one of the people we had, we trained is this woman in, in the, the bright orange. Uh, doesn't show so well. It works really good on a monitor screen, not so great on the, the projection up there. Um, in the, it, that's a fluorescent, fluorescent orange jumpsuit she's wearing. She's the director of Fuyokologique for the whole of the Republic of Congo, 
and this was the first time she had done archaeology in the field. Capacity building, really, really desperately needed. So, uh, syndical outcomes, uh, again, some, some pretty good ones. Um, in the end, we've, we finally ended up with two archaeologists at the A-level, um, and both of them trained in US and UK field techniques. Uh, two, we ended up with two trained ethnographers. Neither of them started off at university and neither of them were intending to become anthropologists or ethnographers. They thought they were just going to be local community liaison officers for the mining company. And they discovered a whole career in the process of watching what was happening and thinking, actually, there's a really important role to be done here. Um, and then lastly, obviously, strengthening the Brazzaville Ministry officials so that they are now more, I hope, more effective in managing the process of archaeology and cultural heritage work in the, the, in the Republic of Congo. Nice outcomes. I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm very proud. Done entirely through commercial funding. And then the case study that I was going to talk about, and some of you have heard this before. Um, it's a favorite of mine, so I will, I will again be fairly brief. Oyu Togoi is the largest as yet undeveloped copper gold mine uh, reserve in the world. It's in the Gobi Desert in the south of Mongolia, right on the border with China. It has uh, cultural affiliations which are more Chinese than they are Mongolian. Um, I happen to really enjoy the time out there because the Gobi nomads are, in my reckoning, the, whole, the people in the world who understand intuitively the most about intangible cultural heritage because that is their heritage. They are nomads. They don't do tangible things like we tend to think of it. It's all intangible to them. So working out there with them in that context was absolutely fascinating. But it's a mining project, so it's places, it's money, it's concrete things. We had to do tangible resources. Again, surveys, huge transects across uh, the Gobi Desert, um, tangible things like uh, Buddhist temples, intangible resources like the Mongolian long song, which is their way of telling the history of Mongolia in song and in music and in dance, um, and then in cultural programs. When asked at the beginning, when we asked at the beginning, what do you aspire? We went to local communities and said, what do you aspire to come out of this project? And the one thing that every single one of them came back with is, we want to preserve our way of life. They actually didn't care much about tangible things, they didn't really, in, this, in the, initial, in the uh, initial stage, worry too much about that, that temple complex. They were worried about their way of life, and that, to me, reflects back on Sintakola and on Sabadola. In each case, people were much more concerned about their way of life than they were about anything much more concrete than that. So the public programs needed to find some way of building in what we could do with a match against their aspiration to preserve a way of life. What's their way of life? That conversation took four or five months because that's not a way that they were accustomed to trying to explain it and we didn't have any way of understanding it had they known in the first case what to say. It's a long dialogue to have to reach a point where we understood what the other was saying. The, the outcome here is, is this implementation plan, which was, which was really quite exciting. And this is one of the things I was going to say, because we started off to do, this was as simple as an environmental impact assessment for a mine. And we ended up in 2014 with a completely new uh, bill going to the Mongolian parliament for cultural heritage protection. And it was focused on the Gobi Desert. It derived from the experiences of the mining companies in the Gobi for both copper, gold, and for coal, but it's applicable nationwide now. And what it did was begin to build in, uh, don't worry about the lines, it doesn't matter, What? because what they actually try to show is that we were trying to build in systematic and systemic connections between the activities of mining companies and companies building railroads and highways and all the rest of it with things at a local community level like access to land for uh, for their camels and for their sheep and for their ponies and access to the places which are important to their way to their way of thinking their their um, their family and their lineages uh, homelands often often an area of pasture or a point where there's water available on the surface and so on so it's it's a very mixed or very um, interface between tangible and intangible heritage 
But what was important to them was the intangible side, and that had to be built into not just the way the mining company was going to operate, but the way the country would, would work with mining companies in the future. And that's part of what, what came out of that. A, a fabulous outcome with a very enlightened commercial client. And again, no governmental support whatsoever. So that was, that was sort of where I got to the context here, thinking that I've done all this work, and I was going to come up and follow behind Keith, and he was going to talk about UK soft power, and I was thinking, I don't know what that means. I haven't seen that. I haven't felt that. Well, that's not quite true, because being on, on the committee for the British Council's Cultural Protection Fund, I have now actually seen it and experienced it. And that experience is absolutely top-notch. It's, it is superb. I can't express how good I think that program is. If you want to know much more about it, tomorrow afternoon, 4.30 p.m., Built Heritage in Time of Conflict session, Amy Eastwood will be speaking. She can be much more authoritative about it than can I. Go there. Listen to it. And, that's it. and I thought, that's one instance I knew. And I thought, how do I, how do I tie my experiences to what I have seen before in cycles of UK TI trade missions to other countries, and an absence of UK soft power on the ground in the places where I was working. So, okay, in my, in my experiences, the context was that they're all private sector, that's all commercial funding, no support from any government, and therefore they're examples of commercial corporate social responsibility on my part and on the part of my employer clients and of professional institutes, because key to that was, was my membership in the Institute of Archaeologists here, and also as a member of the Register of Professional Archaeologists over in America, both of which require me to work the, to their standards everywhere. So each of those projects had to be done <laughs> according to CIFA standards and guidance. And that's great, and I actually really firmly believe in that, but it's got nothing to do with UK soft power or so I thought. Well, this led me to think about the ways in which we're working. And I thought I could reduce this down to, to two different ways, two systems. Um, and the first one I, I want to call social license. Um, sometimes it's called polluter pays. <clears throat> I don't like that because I think it makes a really unhelpful link between um, heritage and pollution. That wasn't very clever, guys, but OK. We don't, tend to, we don't tend to use that phrase too often working outside of the UK, but it's not a very useful phrase. Um, and a commercial context, that often in the minds of a lot of our colleagues, some of whom are in this room, I'm sure, and certainly I've had endless debates with them at things like EAA conferences and in SAFA conferences in Africa and so on, a race to the bottom. Got to do it fast. Got to do it cheap. It's all commercial, bottom line. Don't worry about quality. You're not trying to find something. You're trying to tick a box and get out of the way. Often we're dealing with local indigenous communities, and this is where I got, I, I began to think I had a point to make here, because we're dealing with local indigenous communities who have, whoa, have no vice. That's not right. They have no voice, and they have no locus. Sorry, you can see I was typing late at night last night. Blame Pete. We had two pints before I got there. Um, okay, they have no voice, and they have no locus. They are the local communities, often remote from a capital. They may well be of a different ethnicity. They may well be of a different religious background. They are not easily or directly represented in their own government, never mind in dealings with a mining company or any other major developer. Um, so government, not government, government may well apply political pressure for, develop, for the developments that they think are good, very paternalistic. Oh, we need that road. Well, we use the Chinese money, and they'll build a road directly from the mine to the coast. Doesn't help anybody else. It's a great six-lane highway. goes from a mine to the coast. And that's really, really common. A local community, a whole series of local communities who had no, no voice and no locus. And that's work's done through what I would call social license. It's what we in, in this country tend to call commercial archaeology. But to distinguish that, there's the other way, which is the national patrimony. It's top-down. It's driven by the nation state. It's typically a monopoly. Um, so 
ideally, the practitioners of cultural heritage don't have the pressures of doing it really quickly and getting out of the way of the mining company. They can focus on doing the job really well, ideally. But of course, they don't have the political power back in the, the capital to drive their ambition, to drive their aspirations. Back in the capital, who's got the power? Ah, Department of Mines, Department of Industry, because they are the ministries bringing in hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, pounds, euros worth of funding. We're all familiar, a very real possibility of <coughs> fraud, bribery, and corruption. Why? Because money's being spent far from any local, well, in a, in a local area, far from any oversight and overview. They have the same political pressures of a favored development being imposed because the government thinks it's right and proper. And I, okay, I'm being provocative here, and I'm not saying this always happens, but you can appreciate that the possibility is real. And they have the same, therefore, the same lack of voice and the locus for local indigenous communities to have any influence on what's going on in their own backyard affecting their tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And lastly, the links to the cultural heritage, the links of, of cultural heritage to the national narrative are often at odds with the local group, further depriving them of any sense of self-identity. Okay, two big, two big tr systems of doing cultural heritage. And how does something like cultural diplomacy or soft power fit to that? How does the system being used uh, in the donor country work with that in the recipient. Where does the host country expertise reside? Well, in the UK, it resides out there. It's out there in the private sector. Not solely, but largely. The UK has huge expertise, and it's in the private sector. Cultural diplomacy is being conducted by the government. Not that they don't have, and Henry's here as, as an exemplar of the connections between us, but that connection isn't natural and it isn't built into the system. And where does it reside in the recipient country? How does the recipient country tend to think of doing its own cultural heritage? By way of social license or by way of national patrimony? So if we have private, sex, private sector expertise not being completely picked up by a donor government who's then trying to feed it into a recipient system where it's tended to be done by national patrimony, you understand there's a disconnect. The two simply don't mesh. And I thought, oh, I, I answered my own question at long last, you may say. Uh, this was late last night. I finally answered my own question because I'm working in systems, I have worked in systems and places where there is that inbuilt systemic mismatch. And so one of the things I would say, and this is my, my way of finishing, you'll be glad to know, my way of saying to Keith is, let's have a have a really thoughtful set of discussions about how it's done here and how we make that more sensitive and to fit more effectively into systems, into recipient countries where we would like to exercise some cultural diplomacy. That's it for me. Thank you very much.